Well, it's good to be with you on this Sabbath. Happy Sabbath to everyone. I uh, appreciated the sermonette very much. I'm always amazed how men who are supposed to be educated in the Bible and Scripture can have such a narrow, narrow, narrow view of God's Word. It's, it's, it's like, well, anyway, like tunnel vision. You know, they see one thing and that's all they can see. They can't put it all together. But such is God's Spirit. You know, the church of God has always had to struggle against the social, cultural, and ethical norms of this world. It seems that no matter the age in which the church existed, no matter how educated or enlightened the people in the church were, the church has had to continually resist the encroachment of worldly social, political, and economic thoughts and pressures. Pressures that you and I have to face each and every day as we live, work, and coexist with a world whose values are slipping farther and farther away from the way of life to which God has called us. You know, the ways of this world are truly a powerful force, a force that pulls incessantly against God's people. It's like the force of gravity that continually pulls things toward the surface of the earth, which we're thankful for, of course. Without it, we couldn't exist on the earth. Gravity that is all around us doing what it was created to do, and yet we don't feel it pulling us down we don't see it in the air around us. We're not even consciously aware it's there. It's just continually exerting its pressure on us. And I like gravity, the pull of this world is often imperceptible to us. We don't even realize that we are slowly being drawn into a state of compromise. You know, one of the greatest ploys that Satan and this world uses to entice us to compromise is to draw us into those areas of life we may call gray areas. You know, Satan is a super intelligent spirit being who has had millennia now to perfect his ways of deception and perversion. And one of the ways that he wears us down is to place as many issues as he can into gray areas. Areas that, as man reasons, have no right or wrong answer. There are many shades of gray, and they're all areas that are full of what-ifs. Here is how the American heritage uh, idiom dictionary describes the term gray areas. Indeterminate territory, undefined position, neither here nor there. For example, there's a large gray area between what is legal and what is not. We have a great judicial system that plays on that every day. It continues... This term, which uses gray in the sense of neither black nor white, or halfway between the two, kind of reminds you of another term in the Bible, doesn't it? Hot or cold. It says it dates only from the mid-1900s. Even though this term may not have come into use until the 1900s, God has a lot to say about how we as Christians should deal with such areas in our lives. So what I'd like to do today is to, to take a look at God's Word and let's see some principles and examples we can use to help maneuver ourselves through the landmine of gray areas that we face every day. First of all, we need to know and believe where we must go for instruction. Isaiah 40 and verse 8 says this, The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of God stands forever. 
the Word of God preserved for us in Scripture will be true throughout eternity. Think about that for a moment. The very Word that you are reading now, that's on your lap or on your computer, is going to be the same Word that's going to be there throughout eternity. Peter says in 1 Peter 2 verse 2, that we are to be as newborn babes desiring the milk of the word. Why? That we may grow thereby. Or as some translations say, that we may grow up to salvation. Paul expands this thought over in the book of 2 Timothy, if you would turn there. 2 Timothy chapter 3, in verse 16 and 17. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. He writes, or Paul writes to Timothy, he says, All Scripture, A-L-L, all Scripture, is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. And what's the end? That the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. So, to the subject of gray areas, our first and primary source of knowledge must be the Scriptures rather than our own human reasoning that we all tend to want to use in such matters. We must look at the principles of God's Word to direct us in all our decision-making, especially in any gray areas that need to be made clear. This is what we find the Apostle Paul teaching us to do throughout the book of 1 Corinthians that we will look at some today. Paul is addressing a number of particular subjects as he is writing to the Corinthian church. But the principles revealed are used to address many different scenarios. Turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Notice what Paul says in, with regard to his role in teaching God's truth. 1 Corinthians chapter 11 in verse 1. He says, Imitate me just as I imitate Christ. As the apostle who had founded the church at Corinth, Paul himself was the standard of godliness and spirituality, of integrity and character. Remember, people did not have leather-bound Bibles or a library of Bible helps or the Internet. They relied on Paul and the other apostles along with the words of the prophets. And Paul spoke for the church under the authority of God. Notice down in verse 13 and 16 through 16 how Paul expressed his authority or this authority in dealing with what must have been another gray area to some of the people at the congregation in Corinth. Verse 13 through 16. He says, judge among, your, among yourselves. Is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? And of course, we know Paul is referring to hair length. Does not even nature itself teach you that a man, uh, that if a man has long hair, it's a dishonor to him? But if a woman has long hair, it is a glory to her for her hair is given to her for a covering. And notice what he says in verse 16. But if, but if anyone seems to be contentious, in other words, somebody believes that this is not correct, he says, we have no such custom, nor do the churches of God. So Paul made it clear that his authority was expressed here in these scriptures. Now, 
we hope that most of the brethren there in Corinth submitted to Paul, to his authority in the church, and did not cling to their own human reasoning and ideas with regards to how long a man or woman should have their hair. So the words of Paul and the other writers of Scripture become a tool by which we make clear the right decisions in life and how we can avoid gray areas. And that is all the Scriptures. As Kelly pointed out a couple of weeks ago, the Bible is not a bag of trail mix that you can pick and choose what you believe and what you don't. Peter adds additional weight to the authority of the Scriptures when he says in 2 Peter 1, verse 20 and 21, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came by the prophet's own interpretation. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men smoke, spoke as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So we are assured that the principles and examples in the Scripture were not made by men with human wisdom, but they were made by God and His divine wisdom. So one more scripture to solidify our absolute confidence in the word of God in directing our paths. Let's go over to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews 4. It would help if I got in Hebrews. Hebrews 4. And... Verse 12. Hebrews 4, 12. For the word of God is, a, is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of of the heart. Notice it says that Scripture is so sharp and so precise that it is able to divide even the most complicated and detailed things of life. This is how we must use God's Word. So when things are not clearly laid out for us in black and white, but are rather shades of gray where they can become blurred and hard to discern, it is God's Word that can help us distinguish between right and wrong in every situation. In other words, the Bible is sufficient in all areas of righteous living, including avoiding gray areas. Now, gray areas are characterized by human presumptuousness, compromise, disobedience, and ignorance. We place unclear actions or things for which we lack understanding into these gray areas. Why do we often do this? Because it's easier. It's much easier than it is to go against the world, against Satan and against our own human nature. You see, if we can convince ourselves that something we want falls into the gray area, then we can feel more comfortable with doing it. It's that simple. It's not complicated. In our minds, we might reason just a little compromise here and a little compromise there, what's it going to hurt? Well, here is how it works. If Satan can get from us a small concession, nothing too big at first, something that seems inconsequential, but it is the beginning of our downfall. We reason our desire into a gray area with thoughts such as, it's okay, just don't go too far. Or, just this once. 
or it doesn't hurt anyone, or God understands. How close to the flame can we get without being burned? We don't completely deny what we know is right, but it is a compromise. Becoming lukewarm over one area of our life invariably leads to letting down in others. We reason around our desire until we feel that we have found a good excuse or a good angle to justify our doing it. It may not be fatal at first. A lightning bolt doesn't come out of the sky and strike us. But it is only a matter of time before longer becomes too long, occasionally becomes often, and a bit more becomes too much, and then seldom becomes never. When dealing with situations not directly prohibited or promoted in scriptures, we have to consider godly principles before we enter into such areas. Now, God leaves a lot of decisions to our conscience that can't be called a sin or righteousness by man's authority. But Scripture and the accepted customs of the church can help guide us in choosing whether or not certain activities, actions, or situations are appropriate for us to do. Now, for today, I have seven points. You're surprised? I've got seven points to consider as guidelines, if you would, for addressing gray areas. I'll present these in the form of questions. It was simple for me. No single question is sufficient in itself, in and by itself. You have to consider all factors along with prayer and study of God's Word so we can clearly define and see humanly created gray areas. Number one, with a gray area, is it the master or is it a slave? 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 12. Paul writes to the Corinthians again. All things are lawful for me, but all things aren't helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Now the expression here, all things are lawful, is one that a lot of people abuse in order to use it to justify their inappropriate behavior. Now, Paul isn't implying that we are free to determine what is and is not lawful. That is only for the supreme lawgiver to do, not us. Paul was simply relating the truth that God has formed all things for our proper use. And there can be no evil if we use them properly. The things Paul has been referring to as lawful are things that were looked at with indifference. As these, this chapter and others shows, things relating to certain meats and drinks, and he addresses this in more detail in chapters 8, 10, and 11, which you're probably familiar with. What Paul is also connecting this to is the subject of sexual immorality which was apparently the larger subject he was directing to the church at Corinth. You see, this was a big, big issue in Corinth because the Greeks looked upon any sexual activity as lawful. You're not going to Greece, are you? And this was a sin that the Corinthians Christians were often challenged with. Now, human reasoning places such unlawful things in gray areas. 
Godly reasoning sees no gray areas here. Human reasoning moves, moves sexual immortality or even looking upon a woman and lusting into the gray areas. This in turn allows for any number of justifications for such behavior. Even today, we see the sin of homosexual behavior and same-sex marriage having been moved into a gray area where it is finding greater acceptance even among so-called Christians. For those of you who may already know, just yesterday, our Supreme Court ruled that same-sex marriages were legal in all 50 states. It's not been a good week for our nation. It may not be long before even teaching what the Bible says about such behaviors will be outlawed for churches to do. What happens the first time a united minister refuses to marry a gay couple? We've seen things like this in the news, have we not? What are you going to say if you are confronted by a news reporter wanting to know what you and your church teach about homosexuality? Have you even considered that? Among many other things. Is this a black and white issue for you? Or is it a shade of gray? We better know what we believe and we better believe what we believe. Let's continue on here in verse 13 of this chapter. Paul goes on with this in verse 13. He says, Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both in them, both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Notice the subject he's hammering here. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise, uh, raise us up by His power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? You look at yourself that way? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, God says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Who are we joined to? He says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Notice how many times he uses the term body, our bodies, our physical existence, our being, our physical bodies. Verse 19, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit that is in you, that you have from God and you are not your own. Are you free to do anything you want to with your body? I don't think so. For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are all God's. Period. Paul is helping us realize that we have to analyze every choice that we make as to whether or not the resulting action will be a master over us. If something seems to have dominance in our lives and therefore causes an imbalance with other areas of our lives, it may have a mastery over us. God says, you shall have no other gods before me. You all know where that is. In the Hebrew, before me literally means before God's face. We cannot allow anything to be held up before God's face as being of greater value to us than Him. He and He only should have mastery over our lives, as Paul makes clear in these few verses. Number two, is the gray area 
a stumbling block to others. Romans chapter 14, verse 12. Romans 14 and verse 12. Twelve and thirteen. So then each of us shall give account of himself to God. That's who we're going to answer to. To God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather resolve this, not to put a stumbling block or cause to fall in our brother's way. Now stumbling block, block literally means anything put in a man's path over which he may fall. Now we see in Scripture the word is commonly used in a figurative sense to signify anything that will cause him to sin. You and I have to resolve in our minds not to act in such a way that would in any way cause a spiritual brother or sister to sin, either by our example or by having some severe or harsh judgment towards somebody, or provoking them to anger, or being a cause for jealousy, for envy, for lust, for suspicion. We don't want to cause a brother to violate his conscience. This principle applies primarily to a brother who is uninformed or ignorant in some area of God's truth. A brother who must be shown much truth, much love and patience to help them come to see and have a right understanding. But the principle certainly applies to all of us and it applies to our interactions with all people. Number three, is the gray area helpful? And does it edify others? Is it helpful and does it edify others? 1 Corinthians again, chapter 10 this time. 1 Corinthians 10 again. Verse 23 and 24. It says, All things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own, but each one the other's well-being. There are many things that are not forbidden by Scriptures, but as representatives of Christ, the principle that what we do must be beneficial is important. We can do th many things, but those things that will detract from our spiritual life rather than help it along should be avoided. We must always consider the end of our actions, the consequences of our deeds, the result of our decisions. Although something may be lawful, it may not be expedient profitable or helpful. It might cause injury to someone. It might produce scandal. It might damage someone's reputation. It might lead someone to sin. All lawful things don't build up or edify the church. And when they don't have that effect, they aren't beneficial and we should avoid them. Here's a simple example that you've all heard before. We know that the right and moderate use of alcohol is lawful. But if a recovering alcoholic is present at a personal gathering we may be having, it is best not to have alcohol so we don't, we don't tempt them in their weakness or needlessly offend them by our example. If we would apply this simple rule of always seeking the well-being of others, it would help regulate our own conduct in many things for which there not, may not be an exact black and white law. 
It will help us to regulate our dress, our style of living, our entertainment, our conduct at church services, our approach to the world around us. In a nutshell, it would help us regulate our life. Number four, does a gray area provide a witness for Christ to others? Acts chapter one. Acts chapter one and verse eight. Here we have the last words of Christ just before he ascended back to heaven. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Let's start in verse 7. And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times and season which the Father has put in his own authority. We still don't know, do we? Verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses of me in Jerusalem in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. You and I are to be witnesses of Jesus Christ. Our lives should reflect to those around us the very image and life of Jesus Christ. Do people actually see a distinctive difference between us and the rest of the world? Why would people seek to know the hope that is within us if they don't discern a difference? This is where we must strive to not allow ourselves to take on the social and cultural ways of the world. Ways that send the message, hey, look at me, I'm just like you. We're not to be just like the rest of society. In Paul's instructions to Timothy, he said we were not to share in other people's sins and we were to keep ourselves pure. That's in 1 Timothy 5.22. Do you know what it means to be pure? The Greek word is hagnos and it comes from the same root for the word holy. It describes a person as clean, modest, undefiled, morally faultless, and without blemish. So when people see you, when people hear you, when they observe your conduct, do they they see someone who is in the process of becoming pure? Or do you look like and act like everybody else they know? The question that we have to to ask ourselves, is our life a true witness to Jesus Christ and His way of life? Or do we live a life that is filled with gray areas? You know, our God is a loving, gracious, and merciful God. But He is also demanding and specific in what He expects from those who choose to follow him. Yeah, he's he's demanding, but he is also just and fair. Jesus Christ said in Luke 12, 51 that he had come not, he had not come to give peace on earth, but rather division. Either we are all for Christ or we are against him. No gray areas when it comes to our faith and loyalty toward Him. We can't be a true witness if we have a belief system that is full of gray areas. What people see better be what they get. A person whose life is full of gray areas has a life full of compromise. You and I must look the part. We must talk the talk. We must walk the walk that leads to righteousness. Number five. 
with a gray area, do I do it if I doubt it? Do I do it if I doubt it? Back over to Romans chapter 14. Romans 14, verses 22 and 23. Paul writes, do you have faith? Have it to yourself before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he does not eat from faith for whatever is not of faith from faith is sin. Whatever we may choose to do, if we aren't convicted that it is lawful for us to do, then to us it is sin because we do it with the belief that we may be wrong. The subject Paul is addressing here in Romans 14 is eating meat. Meat, of course, that was created for food as we've had made very clear to us. Or just eating vegetables as you can read in verses 1 through 3 of this chapter. Paul addressed a similar situation regarding meat offered to an idol in 1 Corinthians 8 and and, and 1 Corinthians 10. If someone is weak in faith and in their conscience they believe something is lawful, even though God shows otherwise, and they choose to do it anyway, then they sin before God. This is because they do that which they believe is wrong, either through embarrassment of their beliefs or cowardly compliance, or as a direct rebellion against the laws of God. Any of these in itself is a sin against the sincerity, the honesty, and the self-denying principles that we see clearly defined in the Scriptures. In all cases, if we do something that we don't believe to be right, it is a sin and our conscience will condemn us for it. Now, the converse of this is not always true. That is, if we believe a thing to be right, then it's not a sin. God has not given us the power nor authority to determine what is and is not sin. His Word is the only authority on sin. So if you have any doubt over doing something, Just don't do it. Number six. I like this one. With a gray area, would Jesus have me to do it? First John. Chapter two. First John, chapter two, verse three. Now by this we know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. He who says, I know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar and the truth is not in Him. But whoever keeps His Word, truly the love of God is perfected in Him. By this we know that we are in Him. He who says He abides in Him ought Himself also to walk just as He walked. You know, most people are far too presumptuous when it comes to creating gray areas by presuming to know God's will without ever asking if this is something that God would have them do or that what God would do or Christ would do. Now, seriously for a moment, hypothetical situation. If Christ were to walk in here right now and He was to sit down beside you, what thoughts would be going through your mind about how He would see you? Here you are sitting among His people on His holy Sabbath day. How do you look? Yes, in your physical appearance, which he will see, but also in your heart, which he sees also. 
It's a sobering thought. To declare ourselves to be one with Christ binds us to imitate Him. If we keep His Word, and that's all of His words as inspired in the Scriptures, as I said, it's not a bag of trail mix, then we abide in Him. It's what we just read. This means that we have habitual fellowship with Him by keeping His commandments. To walk as He walks means that our imitation of Him must be exact in all things. 1 Peter chapter 2. Oops, too far. 1 Peter 2. In verse 21 and 22. Let's go back up to verse 20. For what credit is it when you are beaten for your faults that you take it patiently? But when you do good and suffer, if you take it patiently, this is commendable before God. For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us leaving us an example that you should follow His steps. Verse 22, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in His mouth. You see, we can't truly know Christ unless every aspect of our lives is in perfect sync with Him. And in Christ... There are no gray areas. Number seven. Does the gray area glorify God? Does the gray area glorify God? This is probably the most important principle to consider in everything that we do. Does it or does it not glorify God? The other six principles we have covered help answer this one question. Do we evaluate everything we do by this criteria? Or do we just go along with whatever seems right at the moment? 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Verse 1 Corinthians 10. Verse 31 through 33. It says, Therefore, whether you eat or drink, again, he's talking about eating, eating, uh, the eating of foods, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to the Jews or to the Greeks or to the church of God. Pretty well covers everybody, doesn't it? Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Now, the the phrase here that's used, the glory of God, is equivalent to the honor of God. It is, in fact, a command that in all things we do, we must honor Him. In doing this, we show others by our example how to praise Him and how to value His teachings. Whatever we do that will promote the kingdom of God and make God better known and loved will be to His glory. Doing all to the glory of God extends to everything. And it must be a constant rule that guides our conduct. Even in small matters as we see here in these scriptures, such as eating and drinking, we must seek to honor God. As we read earlier in 1 Corinthians 6, what we do with our physical bodies can glorify God or it can dishonor God. Doing all to the glory of God means we should honor Him in our families, among our friends and acquaintances, 
and especially among our fellow saints and members of the household of faith. Whatever we can do to advance the honor of God is right. Whatever cannot be done to that end is wrong. I think all of us can admit that we too often wander into the gray areas. Now most of us don't leap suddenly and deliberately into Satan's darkness. We edge ever so slowly away from the light. Not too far at first. We think we're safe because we can still see the light. But as we get farther and farther away from the light, it grows weaker and weaker as the shades of gray begin to close in around us. The pull of the darkness grows ever stronger until the light is no longer there for us. You and I have been blessed to have the veil of spiritual darkness lifted from us. And we have been called into His marvelous light. Satan and this world seek to pull us back into the pit of darkness. God admonishes us in Revelation 18 verse 4 to come out of her, my people, lest you share in her sins and her plagues. We must come out of the gray areas and stay in the light of God's Word. Let's use the principles given to us in the words of God to avoid all the shades of gray that do not build up and edify the body of Christ, but that seek to destroy us. Mm -hmm.